Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. Wrapped in turbulence, many dimensions, political, uh, geopolitical, climatic, and otherwise. Uh, information storms are happening every day. Uh, Andy Revkin here uh, in Wabanaki territory up in Maine, uh, fresh back from uh, totality, which is still stuck in the back of my head, that amazingly black circle surrounded by a brief little flecks of diamond and it was an incredible experience i think uh, one of my guests sarah nichols at least had the same experience yesterday on a different part of maine and i'm here with sarah who's a, uh, a masterful um, a pioneer and leader in crafting ways for uh, waste costs the, the cost of waste reduction to, to to be borne by those who the manufacturers and packagers who uh, provide all these things for us um, it's a great system she's worked on here in Maine. She's now at Clink. You'll learn more about Clink. And uh, Ed Humes, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporter, journalist, and, and, and author of many books, um, and with a wide ranging previous uh, list of books he's done on uh, all kinds of topics. The one topic I think you've done two books on is garbage, which I was talking <laughs> with, with, with Ed uh, recently at a 92nd Street Y online event. And, so I want to ask you, you know, what makes garbage or waste so special that you would devote the hard work it takes to write a book more than once on this topic? Oddly enough, the uh, <laughs> writing about trashy st subjects is actually quite fun. And uh, I, I had a blast working on this book and meeting incredible uh, innovators like Sarah. And... Uh, the first book, Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. I have to admit, it's one of my favorite all-time subtitles. It, mm -hmm. uh, it really focused on what we throw away, what we roll to the curb each week, and how much more we, of that there is than, um, than we realize. And, and when I wrote Garbology, it was 7.2 pounds of uh, stuff that we, each of us, man, woman, and child in America, threw away. This time around, I wanted to expand the definition of waste and look at all the other forms of it that's embedded in our daily lives, in our products, uh, and how we get around, and how we make and produce our food. Everything really is adds up to the most wasteful civilization in history. I think that's a pretty good subject for a book, especially if exactly. you can focus on solutions. That's great. And uh, I'm just going to have Sarah uh, introduce herself briefly. So you're, are you a Mainer by birth? I am. I am. I was born in Bath, Maine. Um, I did move away for a little while and ended up back in Maine because people here tend to grow roots. And when they go away, they, they tend to come back. So that's what I did, too. And and why waste for you? What what was your sort of journey to who you are so far? Oh, that's a very uh, good question. Um, you know, I've been asked that question quite a bit. And to me, it just, um, <clears throat> you know, I've always feel like that I've been an environmentalist, just that's just kind of part of inherently who I am. So I didn't necessarily have an aha, like I care about the environment and want to fix it moment. It's just kind of how I was, I was raised and, um, you know, leave the world a better place than you found it. I took that pretty <laughs> seriously, I guess. Um, but I will say that in, so at UNH, um, that's where I did my undergrad. I, you know, I tried three different majors, um, you know, uh, Physics wasn't really for me. Um, marine biology wasn't really for me. And then I took an environmental resource economics class and I had light bulbs and fireworks and all these things go off. And, um, you know, just these, uh, this, the idea of, um, you know, economics for me is really the study of how people make decisions and um, the systems that are at play that create these big shifts. And I just, you know, and I can apply those basic economic principles to to waste and my work, but also like I find that it's, it's applicable to like my personal life too. <laughs> you know, the value of perfect information and clear roles and responsibilities and, you know, all of that. So, right. yeah. And uh, and then policy, you, you know, you talk about economics, but the word of policy, politics and policy uh, is, is a whole nother morass. And, and Ed has a whole section in his book on, on, on your work in Maine. So what, tempted you to get into that arena i guess it's, it yeah. makes sense if you want to make difference you have to sort of buckle up and dive in or yeah so um <clears throat> after grad school i ended up going to uc santa barbara where ed is now living in santa oh barbara. that's interesting. um but i went there uh for grad school and i uh, specialized in um environmental policy there 
um, so I can continued on my economics journey pretty much. And, you know, I think um, <clears throat> what I think policy is just necessary. We're, you know, a bunch of humans um, living, though we have to kind of uh, create rules about how humans are living on this planet if we're going to sustain ourselves. Um, and I think that, um, you know, for me, I was just lucky enough to get a, a job out of grad school that worked on local policy. And then, um, you know, I kind of, I, I graduated up into state level policy and it's all the same types of skills. All you're trying to do is to get the decision makers to make the right decisions for the public good. <laughs> um, and I just think that it's so fascinating to work, um, like that this, we have these huge catastrophic problems that are um, threatening the existence of humans all over the world, and it's going to take humans to fix it. Um, it's just a, it's, it's a pickle. <laughs> yeah, and 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 again, in the book, um, Ed ranges through a, a number of examples of this, showing the systemic nature of these problems. Mm -hmm. That you know, it's one thing as a homeowner to do the things you can do. My wife Lisa, who's a, a retired environmental educator and teacher trainer, has been great about like switching us over to the little slivers of uh, laundry soap instead of the big jugs and 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 many other examples like that but it's a systemic problem too uh, and we'll talk about the bottle bill and and about recycling payments mm -hmm. in general Ed, just back to you in terms of your book you know how did you what is the balance Ed, for you between the sort of the individual's role and what can be done systemically or on these issues it's 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 really a continuum actually sarah's story is so compelling because she kind of bridges that gap between um uh, individual choices and actions um you know sarah worked for years on, on spreading the word about this idea that the people who create unrecyclable or poorly recycled uh, plastic waste and packaging should be responsible for it rather than taxpayers and consumers. Uh, and she, she got traction on that by converting people to her, her view that, you, you know, one at a time, you know, meet, going to town meetings, talking to people, recruiting people to say, Hey, you know, not only can you make different choices about how you buy, packaged goods, you can also participate in the policy making process. Here's how you can contact your legislators. Here's how you can right. access your local governments and make your views known and, and help champion this policy. Uh, and, and, you know, there was a small army of people by the time Sarah was done saying, we need to make this change because it makes sense. Why should we be cleaning up the mess that others are making? Uh, and, and that was a compelling argument uh, and it turned individual actions into a statewide policy that now is spreading around the country. It's a total yeah. shift in how we recycle. Yeah. And that, here's the page from the book where, uh, you, uh, you, you're citing her, her plan was to make money for Maine citizens and, and cities and towns. I live in Lemoyne, one of Maine's towns. And just, just a month ago, the budget meeting, uh, the budget for recycling came up and and the EPR uh, came up in a way that's coming down the line. So, so Sarah, can you just talk about that journey? What's so interesting to me is what you just laid out there, uh, Ed, is uh, what um, a top Biden administration official, Jigger Shah, told me on a broadcast about um, the Inflation Reduction Act and the, uh, the um, infrastructure law huge buckets buckets of money but it's not the old story anymore it's a story of abundance and what has to happen is for as he said something like he said there's 19,500 towns in america and only 5,000 of them are bigger than i don't know uh, 10,000 people and he said so you need you need someone in every one of those towns to be the sort of ch change maker so sarah it sounds like you're kind of you've been that person <clears throat> so just describe that in the context of what others might learn from your experience and how to build change from from all these town meetings upward all right okay all right there's a lot there um <laughs> so uh <clears throat> so for towns like um like lemoyne and others in maine and all over the place um you know waste and recycling is typically the third most expensive thing for them behind say schools and police and fire and all of that so it's an absolutely gargantuan amount of money and it's in in many cases that money's just getting thrown directly into the garbage and I liked one of the analogies 
for me is, you know, the, I don't know if the analogy is the right word, but let, let's say that electricity bills and water bills were also paid for by the town and taxpayers and you pay taxes and everybody can use as much electricity and water as they want. Your neighbor's got a heated pool and lights on all the time. You'd be like, that's not fair that I have to right. pay for all of that. And for some reason, that's OK with trash. I don't um, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of uh, reason that, you know, that was by design. Um, I do think that, um, you know, the the producers of all of this waste, that's kind of uh <laughs> it's part of the plan. Um, so that's the, the the theory behind it is you're you're putting um, you know that's part of the reason I like pay as you throw programs where town you know people pay for their their trash bags in their town because that sends right. like, that personal signal to them to put the stuff in the right the right bin um, and reduce their trash. Um, I only think that that's fair if there's a bin to put it in. <laughs> so charging right. people for trash bags if there's no recycling or composting provided and no really no work behind the scenes to make sure that there's less waste in the first place, I don't find that as fair. So we're extending that kind of that pay as you throw, pay for what you you know kind of polluter pays principle on a grander scale to the producers of packaging. Um, and I guess I want to say that this is not a novel idea. Um, most uh, countries all over the world already do it like this. Um, so right. for many decades, um, all over Europe and beyond, um, th th that's how it, that's how recycling is paid for. Um, and and uh, so that's how we know it works here. <laughs> and that's how we know it can be done when everybody talks about how confusing is this going to be when Amazon and Walmart and Procter and Gamble and Kellogg's all have to pay for this. That's what they're doing. All of you know, Canada, EU, Russia, China, Brazil. So we're the we're the anomaly. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, passing policies in the um, politics in the U.S. is different, uh, <laughs> um, right. with a lot more uh, corporate influence here. Um, and I think you know some a lot of corporations are coming around to this idea and coming to the table. It's you know devils in the details um, here, but there we've you know just since I've been working on these issues for I guess fourteen years now, there's been a huge sea change there. Like instead of trying to um, stop and kill all this this progress they're they're coming to the table in a more meaningful way which is really great yeah ed we're going to get back to some of the other themes in your book in a minute and uh but i wanted to ask you to weigh in on this to um the corporate the corporate power part and uh how whether you're looking at some of the other things you look at in the book like carbon dioxide which is waste <laughs> It's a gas. We don't see it. It's the bubbles in beer, which makes it kind of hard to to make the point about it being an un, unhealthful waste. But uh, what what have you learned in, in writing the book that sort of resonates with, or, or clashes with what Sarah was saying? Oh, well, you know, this producer responsibility or polluters pay principle is um, is so powerful. And and I, I mean, logically, we shouldn't stop with packaging and containers as pernicious a problem as plastic pollution uh, is both for the environment and for the cost of dealing with this mess uh it's it really well as you noted <laughs> it should it should apply to the fossil uh, fuel uh industry as well uh, we are paying for the damage caused by that product uh its entire business model uh, is so profitable because we uh, just excuse it from responsibility that's the same with disposable it's a very good analogy I said disposables um we're in an aberration moment when it comes to producer responsibility this isn't normal in the past and up until the 1970s um beverage companies were responsible for their packaging. And they took those glass bottles back, they washed them and reused them 20, 30, 40, 50 times. We act like reuse is some new concept. It was always right. reuse. Back to the colonial days, we reused bottles. You had to bring them back. Right, right, right. They were literally taking deposits in the colonies from uh, buyers to merchants so they would bring back their valuable and reusable glass containers. So right now, the way we're this supposed convenience of having unrecyclable plastic waste <laughs> stuck being stuck with it that's not normal uh, we just think it is because we've been doing it for a while and we forget that it used to be different um it's a principle of capitalism if we're yeah keeping our profits we bear our costs right that's the idea and that's really what the law in maine and elsewhere holding producers responsible for the cost they're imposing um is is getting back to the fundamentals of capitalism it's not so much regulation as removing a subsidy right 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 mm -hmm. there you go a subsidy that's harmful directly in terms of saddling small towns and 
all of us with these these costs uh yeah, we're paying to kill ourselves basically yeah. wow <laughs> how stupid could you be so sarah this this is a slide from some earlier presentation i think you gave mm -hmm. uh it, it tell, we're going to talk about clink specifically in a minute but mm -hmm. there's a journey here uh, and that has culminated in this new uh, extended uh P epr mm -hmm. law that's coming down the pike. So, so what, is there something weird about Maine or, or um, was it just that you lived here? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, the fact that, that the great. Natural Resources Council of Maine exists um, and has uh -huh. for over 60 years is part of the reason. So that's um, where I was working for 10 years when I, when I worked on this law. Um, so in, you know, in, in the seventies, um, Maine was the, I guess I'm feeling, second, maybe third state to pass the bottle bill. There was all right, uh, right around the same time with Oregon and Vermont. Um, and, you know, that's the deposit return system, which is a type of an EPR um, approach where the producers are, are responsible in some way for managing the, the waste on the other end. Um, and actually, Angus King, our, our, one of our sitting senators now, um, was NRCM's lead lobbyist for that, which I think is a fun fact. Um, and, you know, Maine really became, um, we're, we're one of the states with the most types of these EPR laws. So for people who are listening and can't see this slide, there, you know, we have a law for batteries, mercury auto, auto switches, electronic waste, mercury thermostats, cell phones, mercury lamps, paint. Um, and if this was a, a newer slide, you'd also see um, unused pharmaceuticals um, mm -hmm. and the packaging law that we passed here. Um, and we actually are unique in Maine too in 2010. Um, before I started working at RCM, we passed up a product stewardship framework law, which actually made it a policy of the state to move more product categories into this type of system if they met certain criteria. Um, and you know, one of them is voluntary efforts to recycle aren't enough. Um, it's a you know taxing on taxpayers and municipalities, all these things. So that pretty much every single thing hits, hits the mark. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think that Maine, too, part of the reason why, uh, one of many reasons why we're special here is uh, we, as a cultural part of who we are, we don't like waste here. Um, you know, we yeah. just, we like to use it up, wear it up, you know, wear it out, make it do or do without that whole thing. You know, my grandfather used to have a, a, a tin of um, nails too bent to use, like it literally said that on the tin. So I think, and then, you know, we're also smaller. There's not so many cooks in the kitchens here. And uh, yeah. we have a citizen legislature that is, you know, um, not as influenced by um, corporate interests. So I think um, that has really made us a fertile ground for this type of policy. And uh, Ed, you, in your travels, you found other anomalous towns in terms of other kinds of waste, energy waste sure. in particular that violated the idea that we're all in these red and blue buckets and that we fundamentally behave differently if we're in one or the other. Can you talk about Georgia? There, there was a town, or was it Georgia or Florida where you, the, the, the golf carts and all that stuff. Peachtree City, Georgia. Yeah, Peach that's so, so, transportation's the most wasteful thing we do, really. And and our, our cars are just horrendous wasters. You know, four out of five bucks you pay at the at the pump is it goes to the waste that your car is generating, and you know that fraction that's left over that's what actually turns the wheel. So we're we're a little backwards on the physics of our transportation, and and that's yeah. fixable in a variety of ways. Peachtree City, Georgia, for years has been kind of just parking their cars. They haven't gotten rid of them. It's a right. town of about forty thousand. Uh, 30 miles or so from Atlanta, and they uh, have a secondary road system that just kind of evolved over the years, uh, over 100 miles of it now that connect everything in and around town all the way to the local, the regional airport, and the industrial park, the, you know, restaurants, the downtown, everything. And so uh, wild. no cars are allowed. It's golf carts. Uh, and it's... Uh, uh, or golf, uh, you know, not much. It's not all connected to golfing. I guess suppose it started that way. And they <laughs> e bikes, regular bikes, hikers, walkers are allowed on these pathways at all, but not cars. Uh, and there's there's crossings, and they're signed for golf cart crossing, which have you know cars have to yield to them. And it's kind of paradise for these folks. You know, you think I got there, I was very skeptical. You know, golf carts are really terrible substitute for a car and then you leave and say wow you know a car is a really poor substitute for a golf cart it's just it's fun <laughs> right, right, right. there's no traffic there's no crashes there's there's scenery there's 
socializing. You just stop and chat with a person in the other lane on your commute to work. Who does that in the real world? Well, this part of the real world you do. It's it's so inexpensive. So it's the best second car you're ever going to want to have. These This little electric vehicle that does... 90% of what you need to do in a vehicle because, you know, that's how we drive. Half of our trips are three miles or less. 93% of them are under 25 miles. You can do all that. You don't need a 500,000, 500, 5,000 pound, $50,000 Tesla to, you know, go get a bag of burgers through the drive through which is more like how we drive every day than, than right. the long road trips we seem to be obsessed with when we think about electric cars. Um, this is an alternative, right? And it, it saves a ton, a ton of money. You know, it wasn't motivated by concern about the environment or climate. It was motivated by having a, an accessible, inexpensive way to get around most of the time. It's it works. Yeah, I got a comment in here from Joanne McGarry. She's in Humboldt County, California, a longtime viewer of Sustain Wet, saying, "Donating my car. Gas is five ninety nine a gallon here. Taking the bus." <laughs> Triking to food co-op, walking to Cal Poly, it can be done. I guess it you're can, saying for sure. Anything. That's great. And and El, El, Alyssa Zazara has been posting too. Love that. Use it up. Wear it out. Oh, she likes your bent nails. I must say, I, I, I haven't been. I haven't been like that. It doesn't have. It does not have a label on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, so, Sarah, you've been doing uh, some road showing here now. Uh, you go to, I think, uh, have you testified in for various states where this process is poised to possibly spread? For the EPR for packaging law? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've since, um, so after we passed I the mean, law. Maybe, maybe previous, yeah, yeah, before I before you got to where you are now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, after we passed the law in Maine um, at NRCM, we created a EPR for packaging advocacy toolkit um, and put it online and have top 10 tips and tricks. I feel like we learned so much going through this process that we wanted to help, you know, make sure that other states didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, and each state is really unique. But um, anybody who's interested in pursuing this in their state, go there. It's got a ton of useful information. Um, and I've done a lot of presentations for, for people in other states. Um, submitted a few testimonies here and there, but I think my value is more in, um, at, at that point was helping the, the margins, uh, which we can talk about that um, Edward wrote in his book, but helping the, the, the people in those um, towns, um, in those states, really gain the tools that they need to do the work um, and, and provide resources to them that way. Dig, a dig in a little more in that story you were just about to... Oh, with the marges? Yeah. So um, I love this. So uh, <laughs> in my job before I worked at NRCM, um, I uh, worked at a little organization called RCAP Solutions. I had a grant under rural, USDA Rural Development to help towns in New Hampshire increase their recycling. Um, and I worked with this wonderful woman, Marge Bonneville, um, in the town of Tilton to pass a pay-as-you-throw program and make recycling easier there. Um, you know, we had the, kind of this movie-like ending to get that through the town council. It was wonderful. And she was just such a force. I, and I realized that you can't, like, I couldn't march into a town of Tilton with my own agenda. You know, mm -hmm. I, I want to be there to help the people that are doing the things. And you have to have a march in that town or nothing will get done. So <laughs> after that, you know, I went to go work uh, at NRCM and, and focus a lot on local policies, a lot on um, plastic bag bans um, and foam bands, which did lead to the state level policies, but I wouldn't work in a town that didn't have a marge. And I just really learned so much from that. So, um, you know, the, my friend Victoria Simon is the marge in York, Maine, who uh, worked to pass the state's first plastic bag ban. And um, I actually just went to her 75th birthday party on Friday night. And I realized I've known her for 10 years and people were asking how I knew her. And she's like, well, I found Sarah's name in the paper and called her up. And that's, that's what it takes to be a Marge. You're just, <laughs> you're kind of, you want to do it and you need some help and I'm there to help that kind of person. So Ed, across the landscape of the waste not landscape, how many kinds of Marges, <laughs> or have you found situations that don't involve Marge? It feels like this is, as I said earlier with Jigger Shaw, in terms of harvesting federal resources for LED bulbs and everything, they need a Marge. He didn't use the name Marge, but yes. I get it. So, no. so what, how do we make more of them? The, the Marges are iconic. And, and I, I, I just love that story because it's so human. 
I love everything about it. And I met Victoria as well. She's, she's a diamond dynamo and she shows up. <laughs> that's, I think yeah. that's the secret to being a Marge. You show up mm -hmm. and every community does have a Marge. Uh, they may not know how, what, they, they know they want to do something. They're not sure how. And kind of, you know, <laughs> Sarah's the Marge Whisperer. She kind of gives yeah. them some, some tips on how they can get involved. And um, those, those pieces are so essential. And and seeing the results, because this was a, this law in Maine was really a grassroots driven process. Mm -hmm. And and businesses were won over, the, the leading Brew, uh, craft brewer in the state, Allagash Brewing, got on board and said, you know what? We should be responsible for <laughs> this mess we're making. You, you guys are right. And I'm I'm in. Uh, and it helped beat back this sort of automatic pushback. Oh, this is regulation. It's going to kill jobs. It's going to raise prices. And so you had other businesses saying, no, I mean, we can do this. And then the fact that Canada and other countries were doing you know, they're kind of materialized experts right, right. from those countries who came in and said, no, we've never seen price rises. There's no job losses from this. All the myths were shot down. Uh, and that combined with the, the, the that grassroots public support for something really big and, and game changing uh, all came together. I, I think mm -hmm. Sarah mentioned that uh, even the uh, um, you know, across across political parties, the leaders uh, in the legislature in Maine got on board and supported this bill. It's I, I think it's it's kind of an example of why framing our um, environmental problems like plastic pollution, but also wait, uh, climate and other things around the subject of waste. It's just the big tent. Everybody, you know, mm -hmm. I think I said this when we were uh, uh, on uh, the 92 uh, Why, 92nd Street Y show that it's, you know, there's no political faction saying, yay, waste. You know? <laughs> it's just, it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> and what Sarah did is really flip the switch, as you said in the title of the show, on, on what happens to our waste and who should be responsible for it. And ultimately, I think it's going to drive us uh, toward a more reusable economy instead of a disposable economy. And that is going to benefit everyone, including businesses. So, so uh, Sarah, you've dealt with the business sector too. And how, uh, how rare are the Allagashes, uh, you know, or, or what? I love the Marge. I'm going to stick with the Marge meme. Yeah. Yeah. We need the Marges. Uh, the Marges we, in the business. What makes for an Allagash? Well, Allagash became a Marge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, with, with some heft, right? So they really cool. deserve some credit. So um, mm. Rob Todd is the, the president of, of Allagash. And, you know, we did, you know, we did outreach to a lot of businesses and, you know, it was just nice. They were, they were the first ones that really just entertained us in a really you know, in a real way, they're like, okay, we don't really like the idea of this, but we're going to sit down and listen to you. And they did, they had a lot of meetings, they discussed it internally, we helped them calculate what their costs might be if they were operating in Ontario or Quebec, um, just so they could wrap their heads around the idea. And they, the fact that they took the time to even try to do that, which was was great. We, you know, some of the other businesses were like, oh, this is too confusing. We don't know what's going on. So we're just going to say no. And they were just, they took the time to actually try to understand it. And it, they really turned into advocates, which I wasn't expecting. Um, and they, I just can't say enough um, about how important their support was and to almost um, split the business community. So it wasn't like this false choice of, oh, you're going with the environmentalists or the businesses, you know, to so to kind of split these factions up so that it's, um, it's just it's so important to do. Yeah. Is there some um, scale thing here? Allagash, you said, is, is big. It's the biggest in Maine. Is that what you mm -hmm. said? For, uh, I was at a meeting in Washington years ago of like corporate responsibility and sustainability. And um, I, I raised a question. There was a panel with a guy from Nike. Uh, they're like senior vice president for all this stuff. And I said, you know, there's this great guitar company, Taylor Guitar Company, where the leader of the company out on the West Coast, um, he's made it a priority to uh, like go right down the chain to where their ebony comes from you know, to make the fingerboards and their guitars. And and they've worked with their customers to, to understand that uh, for, for us, the most beautiful guitar doesn't have a beautifully perfect black ebony fingerboard it has a marbled one because the trees that we get it from are from a community and they blah 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 
And I and I asked the guy from Nike. I said, you know, why aren't the Nikes doing that? He he said, well, we, you know, we've done, we do like audience, we do surveys all the time of our products. And he said, if you mark a sneaker sustainable, it's like a downer. People people see it as a compromise. <laughs> I went, oh my god. <laughs> So, so the scale issue or that issue seems to still be there. I, I'd love to think there's a way to spread the Allagash kind of uh, gestalt. Yeah. And, you know, that's really related to, to food waste, too. You know, people in the United States, they expect, you know, the shiny, perfectly, you know, proportioned fruit or vegetable, or they're not going to touch it. People are sifting through, taking out the blemished ones. I usually take right. those because right. um, <laughs> and you can just cut that part off. Um, but it's, it's that whole, that whole perception. People don't expect that in other countries necessarily, you know, and they don't need, That's true you, too. Know, you know, so it's, it's, it's cultural, um, here too. Um, yeah. So talk briefly about Clink. I, I'm, I don't have the sound off uh, and anyone who's listening to this later as a podcast won't hear anyway. Uh, there's this, uh, little visual online on YouTube for Clink, but what are we looking at here? Great. So um, Clink is where I work now. Um, I've just started as their director of government affairs um, in early February. And um, what Clink is, is really a, a circularity solutions provider. Um, so we're the, the intermediary between, say, consumers and getting that material for recycling back to the producers, let's say. And right now, um, you know, bag drop recycling in beverage container um, deposit systems is where we're operating mostly, but we're really poised for growth and um, it's really exciting to be kind of on the implementation side of a lot of these policies that I've worked to pass. Um, so, you know, I'm a clean customer uh, in Maine. We um, where I have these uh, sustainability stations, drop off locations at all Hannaford locations. So I buy by clink bags at Hannaford. I have my own special code. Um, that's for my account. I fill it with my bottles and cans here at home. And then when it's convenient, I just drop it off at Hannaford and let the money accumulate into my account. Um, and then I usually wait till, you know, 25 or 30 bucks is in there. Um, and that's when I, and I can apply it to my uh, grocery bill. And that's usually the week where I buy my, uh, my bullet bourbon, um, and, uh, um, get my stock at home, but everybody has their own story. They might save it up for vacation, or you could easily donate to charity from the app or a lot of charities have their oh, that's interesting. Apps. So it's a really easy way for a lot of people to do redemption. Um, you know, you get your money back in within two days. Um, some people like to watch people count their containers and get the money right back. And that's great, too. Um, but this is this is how, how we do it. And we're operating in several other states and working to expand. And it's really fun that as their director of government affairs, you know, I can work to um, expand beyond 10. There's only 10 states in the whole country that have this kind of system. And I can work to try to pass those policies in other states. And um, it's there's just so much potential. You know, bottles and cans are really the low hanging fruit of all of this packaging. They're yeah. all highly recyclable. A lot of the manufacturers are demanding this material back. They they want it. It's clean. It's valuable. It actually gets turned into new stuff. Um, and we can you know through this system too, we could help facilitate reuse because to get reusables back, you have a deposit on those things. Those could easily get put into the same stations and get you know brought to a washing station and, and returned back too. That charity, mm -hmm. the fact that you can have it go to a charity, et cetera, automatically mm -hmm. is interesting. Uh, I was just at a, I'm a songwriter on the side, and I was at a, uh, uh, an Irish music session the, just this weekend, and a woman r sang a hilarious song she wrote a long time ago about redemption, redemption centers in Maine. <laughs> As a newcomer, she had, you know, was oh, trying yeah. to get used to that whole process. Uh, would this put them out of business, or is it just like an evolution of how things? would work? Um, not necessarily. Like I said, I think um, it's different people have different um, preferences for how they'd like to redeem. And I yeah. think having a network of all kinds of different types would appeal to different people is is great. Yeah, I think that makes mm -hmm. tons of sense. Um, mm -hmm. And right now, like at our at our transfer station, there's a separate place for the, res the redeemables. And then there's the recyclables and then there's the trash. Uh, but it would be great if there's some way to do it this way. I didn't, I, I have to go to our head of words and check it out. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's really, it's the easiest thing for a lot of people. I know I, I saw the date I went into my Clink account because I can see behind the scenes now. And, um, you know, I saw the date that I signed up was right when my second child was born. I think I just was like, I don't have time to go to the redemption center anymore. Exactly. Um, 
And then that's, and that's how that worked. And I think for a lot of the businesses, so the retailers that have to participate in these laws, they prefer this clink system. It makes, it takes all the burden off of them sure. um, too, and, you know, drives foot traffic to the store and increases their brand and all these things. So. Yeah. Can you so, please and, come to California? Cause it's yes. really hard to redeem. Here. Yes. That's People actually in the recycling bin and lose them millions of deposits. Uh, Cal- oh. going clean. California's oh, bottle bill is a mess and I'm not afraid to say it. Everybody knows it. Um, but we were actually just in California a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I really hope to bring Clank out to California. So stay tuned. Yeah. It, I guess it's still kind of a morass out there in terms of different state policies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but, you know, the American way is <laughs> <Yeah>. complicated. <laughs> so, Ed, who should be reading your book? And, and like, how much of you do have a section that's sort of a, and you have a, a website or I think that's set up to try to give people some practical steps, uh, sort of like that toolkit that Sarah mentioned for spreading EPR gospel. Uh, who should be reading your book and what are some of the ideas you, you want to? Oh, well, everybody, of course. Of course. <laughs> what, what, how do you ask that question? Uh, no, I, I think I really, one of my motivations was to find stories about solving these, these problems, like yeah. what's happening in Maine and, and, and what Sarah's accomplished there. But uh, there's different areas of our lives where, where waste is, is ever present. Um, we talked about transportation, but it's also in our, energy systems and how our buildings, um, our clothes, you name it, there's rampant waste, but there's things that can be done both at the top of the the line, you know, the policy decisions, but, but also in our own consumer choices, which collectively have power to influence those top down decisions. So um, I looked for stories and it turns out there's a lot of them where there's multiple benefits to choosing a, a more sustainable approach, a less wasteful approach, often economic, sometimes health, like changing, uh, getting away from natural gas that uh, creates emissions that are harmful inside the house, harmful to children. Um, you know, there's, there's a com- compelling reasons besides environmental ones not to use a gas stove in your house. And, and um, you know, if you have children, right. any kind of respiratory issues, you really shouldn't be cooking with gas. It's it, it's a trigger for asthma and a lot of other bad things. And that's just one small example of different reasons why a less wasteful, less uh, um, unsustainable approach to different things in our life would, would pay off. You know, I, th- I say it's not about giving up things we love. It's about upgrading to things we're going to love better. And you talk to some of the chefs who are switching their busy restaurants to away from gas and open flames to, um, to cooking with magnetic induction. It's like this magical way to cook without heating right. up the room, just heating up the food. It's, it's game changing for restaurants because you also cook faster, yeah. you have healthy, happy staff and you make more money. It's kind of wins on all fronts. And, there are so many things we can do in our own lives to uh, upgrade rather than give up stuff we love and live healthier, live more sustainably, help the planet, help ourselves. Uh, that I tried to fill the book with those kinds of stories because it's it's the secret sauce of feeling less hopeless and more hopeful about what the future can look like. Yeah, and I, I do think this is an arena where um the quote unquote average person can make a difference if they test out something like those laundry strips that my wife has. They work great. (laughs) They're awesome. But if if they they do that and then say, did you hear that? Whether, whether it's on Facebook or just to their neighbors, uh, because otherwise, you know, you go to the markets and uh, I wrote about this years ago, the end caps, you know, companies and supermarkets pay more for the end of the aisle. And I haven't seen those strips there yet. When you walk into the laundry aisle, all you see is the big jugs and the strips are like sort of these little things. They're there now, which is kind of a miraculous to me, but they still have to compete in this. Uh, the inertia factor, I guess, is mm-hmm. big. And I do think the average person can make a difference by just sort of posting on on instagram or whatever hey you know i tried these strips that it's kind of amazing but they work uh mm-hmm. lisa even uses the shampoo it's uh, like uh shampoo kind of 
pasty stuff instead of buying a bottle. So, so does that feel resonant for, for you guys? There oh, is yeah. something else to do that's not just about us. I, I think it's a crossover kind of, kind of idea because um, you try these things. You're also supporting a business. It's creating less uh, of a footprint in the world. It's 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 a win-win up and around. I see Andy Keller's commenting in here. He's yeah. the founder of another solution, a reusable bag called Chico Bags. And, oh. uh, I I wrote about him in the first uh, book or volume. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What is a Chico nice bag? You, <laughs> what is a Chico bag? Oh, I see it here. A little bit better. Yeah, it's a really compact, reusable bag that you can take with you. Um, uh, several yeah. of them that have lived in my in my purse for years. I think my actually, I think my wife has one. <laughs> yeah, and you know, kind of, you know, on theme with what Edward was saying, you know, I those strips they work great. They work better. You know, it's like something we like better. <laughs> Um, right. to me, you know, it's, it's not as heavy to carry, you know, less waste. It's, it's just simpler. It's less messy. I don't have sticky stuff all over the top of my washing machine. You know, I think it's an upgrade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of uh, tooth, um, tooth tablets instead of paste mm -hmm. in a plastic tube. You get a little oh. glass jar of these little tablets and you chew it up. It turns into <laughs> yeah. sort of toothpaste in your mouth. Yeah. And, you know, there's that, a lot of stuff have you don't want in your mouth that comes in a lot of, um, supermarket toothpaste and all that is stripped out of these tablets so i mm. i think they're fantastic plus yeah. they're easy to travel with and travel you know. camping they're so light like it's just if you know for backpacking you want like as light as possible um that's amazing mm. uh you know here i am learning every day <laughs> so I, I hope people can share this uh not everyone can uh Oh God! Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Not a, yeah, I'm just trying to Google away. I don't look that good when I chew mine, but okay. So that's called Bite, I guess. Uh, BiteToothpasteBits.com. So right. interesting. You get fluor fluoridated or no fluor fluoride, whatever you want. I mean, Depending on your misperceptions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you live in Maine, go to GoGo -Go Refill. There's one on Pleasant Street in Brunswick or right. in South Portland. Um, and uh, go see Laura Marston, uh, who's also in Edward's book. Uh, but she sells all kinds of um, no waste products like these there. Oh, we're going to have a total garbage uh, party at uh, mm -hmm. Go Go when I'm up in Maine. So um, uh, when are you come? When are you coming? At the end of the month. Oh, cool! It'll right. be on the 28th. Um, on, it's a Sunday at Go Go Refill in South Portland. Yep. Yep. Great. Yeah. Well, let me yes, know. Yes, you definitely have to come mm -hmm. by. <laughs> I, I love uh, refill stores too mm -hmm. and, and um, zero waste stores like uh, GoGo -Go because mm -hmm. there's such a different experience than going to a supermarket. Oh, <laughs> I, yeah. uh, I, I had the uh, one of the early chapters in the book is my um, <laughs> survey of a supermarket with Jenna Jambach, the like leading plastic pollution researcher and MacArthur genius. Uh, um, uh, and just a really amazing person. But she warned me, you know, a lot of people cry when they're done with this store. <laughs> I didn't cry, but I felt like, uh, I don't want to go back yeah, to work and, and see this anymore <laughs> because the packaging and the waste in every aisle, when you yeah. see it through Jenna's eyes, is why are we doing this to ourselves? Um, why do we have three different kinds of rice for sale in 18 different kinds of plastic unrecyclable packaging. And it just, they're so they're selling the package, not the content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, <laughs> oh, sorry. Go I'm glad it. you brought that up, Edward. I, when I read that chapter about Jenna, I just felt seen. I was like, yes, this is, this is, uh, this, the anxiety that I feel when I walk into a grocery store too, those big grocery stores. And I've done tours around with some local reporters to try to decipher what is the best, you know, um, the best. <laughs> it's like you want to worry about the contents, but also the package. And sometimes they're not in the same, you know, like the healthier version isn't in the better package and it's stressful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> um, I think the packaging law will help streamline types of packaging, hopefully, eventually. Right. <laughs> so that's part of the, the beauty of that and just make it easier. Labeling needs to be easier. Um, but I, I feel her struggle. I, I it's, it's awful. And when I walk into a grocery store, I look around and I just think about how soon will all of this stuff be in a landfill <laughs> or an incinerator? It, it's like, no. it's, it's mind boggling. Well, it's so funny. The only, 
just I, I don't mean to pick on rice, but the only sustainably <laughs> packaged rice we could find it's just in a cardboard box is like the least healthy most processed mm. most salty and chemically I know. treated product around i'm not going to say the brand but uh it, it's just mm -hmm. hilarious and all the organic products were in unrecyclable plastic containers with you know like composites and things that are impossible for the system to deal with it's just so ironic and silly um wow well, there's solutions to that too. I, I, I think so. One of the other storylines is um, uh, a nonprofit in LA called CropSwap LA that turns people's front lawns into these incredible, beautiful, and productive uh, micro farms, urban micro farms. Right. And it sort of inspired me to, re to, to recall that just growing some of your own vegetables is one of the best things you can do for the environment. <laughs> to, to, because you're avoiding packaging, you're avoiding processed food, and it's actually kind of fun and tastes better. The supermarket Absolutely. tomato is nothing compared to the tomatoes in my backyard. So, uh, well, the more of that, the better. And if for so many reasons, lawns are such a bizarre uh, uh, anachronism. Oh, there's crop swap right there. Yeah, yeah. Jemiah Hargens is he's he had this vision that why are we mowing our yards when we could be eating our yards? And he's building these in food deserts in LA where access to fresh produce is um, really hard. And so for him, it's also an equity issue. And they can take a thousand square foot of grass and grow enough fruit and vegetables for 25 to 40 people a week, households, I mean, a week. Wow. Um, and they sell it at cost. It's a nonprofit. They have some outside funding, although it's a constant struggle, as it is with many nonprofits. But these it uses 8% of the water because he recycles it and uses solar power for his, his pumps that a grass lawn does, which is yeah. in LA, highly meaningful. Absolutely. Well, this is this has been a great, uh, you know, introduction to some really spreadable ideas. And uh, I should try to work on that Marge concept more. Um, because <laughs> that, as I said, it relates so much to what uh, Jigar Shah said about harvesting the uh, energy resources that are available now at the, at the federal level that co local communities have to ask for, as he puts it, you know, we we can't force you to change your light bulbs in a way that's profitable, <laughs> your street lights, but you can do it. And mm -hmm. you just need a, a Marge. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I should have bigger and, and maybe I'll get them, maybe put me in touch <laughs> with one or two of the Marges and we'll get bigger Shaw on and do a separate session on, on, on that. Ah, oh, I would love that. I would love that. And, um, you know, Edward was um, kind enough to put in his book, uh, Sarah Nichols' Top 10 Tips on How to Be a Marge. So, yes. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. I should show that part. <laughs> yes, check it out. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thanks again for joining me today, on, uh, especially on such a beautiful day uh, here, day after the uh, monumentally cool totality event. And, and there's so much more to do on uh, how to waste not want not how to actually do it to move to a um, different relationship with resources and with the things that we use uh, whether it's the uh, saving bent nails or changing policies across america that and corporate behavior in ways <laughs> that uh, benefit everyone um, let me just go back to the uh, main screen and thanks again uh, sarah nichols and ed humes good luck with the book good luck with right. clink I'm going to post those 10 tips to the margins on my website, like immediately. I, I didn't oh, think that was what a great and, idea. And I'll so. put it on sustain what, you know, uh, the, uh, my, uh, my, the blog that goes along with what I'm trying to do here. So this is Andy Revkin. Uh, sustain what is uh, frequent conversations about how to navigate complexity and consequential times and come out a little bit better each time. And uh, this was a great example. Good to have you both here. Uh, this gets shared. It can be shared as, as soon as we're done on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, X. And um, let's do more. Thanks again. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Have a great afternoon.